Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So for those that don't know me, I'm uh, Steve Hipskin. I'm the chief of the Earth Science Division here at NASA Ames. Uh, it gives me an incredible amount of pleasure today to welcome Dan Kahan, who's going to give the talk today. But um, before, I, uh, before I go into that, I wanted to give a little bit of a context for what we're doing with these talks. And so Dr. Ram Raman Amani, who's sitting back up there with his hand on his mouth, um, uh, he's the, the PI for the NASA Earth Exchange, or NEX, the development that we've done here at Ames, uh, collaboration between Earth Science and the supercomputing facility. Uh, and so these lectures that we're doing are part of a, an NEX uh, workshop. And so these lectures are being recorded, so this session is being recorded, just so everybody knows. Um, but it's also part of several lectures that are going to form part of this uh, virtual workshop that we're holding on climate, climate modeling and climate change. And so the, the workshop is really three components. And uh, so the one component, so we will have students from essentially around the world. Uh, they will have access. So these lectures uh, will be put up on the NAX website. And so after, I believe, around June 15th, you'll be able to see this lecture and all the other lectures that are going to be held as part of that. So the simplest thing is either to Google NEX or, or just go to nex.nasa.gov to, to take a look at the schedule. Uh, but the second component is we ha we'll have students who will be using uh, Open NEX to do uh, modeling projects. And so Open NEX is the partnership that uh, Rama developed with Amazon and their cloud services. So we're essentially taking taking an, an instantiation of NEX and putting it on the Amazon cloud services. So both the satellite data sets as well as the modeling and um, um, workflow management tools, et cetera. And then as a third part, and the third part is kind of an exciting part of the whole Obama administration at, um, initiative on climate change. And for those that aren't aware, when uh, Obama uh, announced that uh, initiative a couple of months ago in the Oval Office. Rama actually was there with representatives from Amazon Cloud at the uh, Oval Office. Um, but the, the third component is, is a grand challenge. And so there's actually going to be a financial award. I think the total purse is about $50,000. But it's going to be a competition. Again, this is the details of which are on the NEX site. But it's, it's a competition to, de to develop applications that um, solve big climate problems. So speaker today, Dan Kahan. Uh, again, it's a great privilege, privilege to have Dan. Uh, Dan uh, got his degrees uh, in oceanography and meteorology, started with a combination at University of Michigan. I guess he couldn't decide because then he went off and got master's degrees, one in meteorology and then another one in oceanography. And then he finally got his PhD at Scripps in, in oceanography, so I guess he did decide. Uh, but Dan has really done a lot of the pioneering work in climate assessment and particularly looking at the impact of decadal climate change on both our water systems and biological systems, particularly looking at phenology of plants and looking at the impact of climate change on that. And the really powerful thing that he's done is taking the two together uh, and connecting the dots so that he's come up with a way to do decadal scale projections of wildfire risk in the Western United States. So, so because of that deep expertise, Dan has been one of the key authors on the, um, the uh, California climate assessment. So in 2005, uh, Schwarzenegger, through an executive order, uh, ordered that the uh, state agencies would put together a climate assessment on a regular basis. I think it was biannual. It's, it looks like it's more like th every three years. But so Dan has been the lead co-author. Uh, the other lead co-author is Guido Franco from the California Energy Commission, which has the primary responsibility for generating the reports. Um, and so Dan has been the co-lead author on that in the last three reports, so 2006, 2009, 2012. So Dan probably knows about as much as anyone in the country about the impacts of climate on the state of California. So without further ado, I'll turn it over. I'm a little in 
intimidated by that that other speaker over there, but I guess, is this coming through okay? Okay. Thanks, Steve, that was uh, a generous introduction. And uh, thanks, Rama and team, There's a team all over this auditorium. Uh, so as Steve mentions, uh, I'm gonna talk about the uh, California climate change assessments, and um, I'm going to try to cover sort of a range of bases. As, as you all know, climate uh, has many intersections, and uh, certainly in California, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, sectors and systems to be involved. So uh, we'll try to touch on that and, and hopefully kind of bind things together. Um, I, I should mention that um, there's, there's really been a, a broad team of people and these assessments that Steve mentioned actually have been an interesting exercise, uh, kind of a uh, social exercise in the Science Collective in California under which uh, as these assessments uh, went forward, there have been more and uh, both deeper and broader representation of the science community in each of these. So it's, it's been really interesting to see how um, this has enlisted the support of the community of, of kind of cross the board science in in California, and of course, California is a is a great location for that because there is such a rich um, a rich intellectual uh, resource in the in the state. Um, this work has been sponsored both by the state and federal agencies, and uh, and again, um, I'm owing to a number of colleagues, uh, amongst them. Uh, Mary Tyree and Mike Dettinger, who I work with, uh, that uh, have their offices back at Scripps. Um, this, this scene here is a climatology of precipitation across the, the western United States, and the, the color shades are kind of intuitive. The, the um, warm shades are dry, and the blue shades are, the cool shades are wet. And as you all know, California in many locations is a pretty arid uh, place, as is the West. And, and we collect our water in, in uh, very preferred uh, water towers, and then we transport it and, and store it and so forth. The other thing about this is, is it emphasizes the um, the uh, high gradient arena that is California in, in this case, this is a physical quantity, but of course, if we looked at biology, we would, we would see similar uh, structure. And uh, of course, as the climate changes, uh, that means that uh, climate in these, in these high gradient areas is going to be changing over very short distances, and uh, consequently, there's there's probably going to be rearrangements and uh, lots of challenges and so forth. So this makes for a, a really interesting scientific <coughs> laboratory, but also a, a really challenging uh, area for uh, the the impacts and, and the adaptation to climate change because there's, there's so many adaptations that will have to be achieved in or as, as climate evolves. So um, a little more about, about precipitation. This map is, uh, is a collection of weather station information. So this is a bunch of weather records. So each one of these dots 
is, is a uh, long-term weather record. And from, uh, in this case, it's a precipitation record. And what we've done here is we've uh, determined at each location, on average, how many days are required to accumulate two-thirds of the annual total precipitation at that, at that place. And this is color-coded, so you can see there are, there are locations in this uh, area, this is west of the Mississippi, that um, approach 250 days uh, on average to accumulate the bulk of the year's water supply, essentially. But it, um, there are other areas where um, that uh, delivery period is much shorter. So in, in California, we are flirting with, say, 100 days or so on average over which we get most of our, you know, the lion's share of our precipitation. Now, um, and we all know this, we live in a Mediterranean climate. It's, uh, you know, when you look at the annual cycle of precipitation laid out here from summer to winter to summer, it's very peaky. Um, so we get between November and March, we get most of our, our water supply. The one reason this is, is really important is that that window of time over which we generate most of our water, uh, depending on, on the climate pattern that's in place during that period of time, uh, you could be either uh, quite wet or you could be extremely dry. And of course, we've just gone through a, an example of actually three years, and especially pretty much the last year, where conditions were not favorable during this, this uh, winter time window, and we really ended up short. So um, when you... Uh, when you look at the annual totals of precipitation shown here for, uh, this is a Sierra Nevada aggregate uh, time series going back to 1895 and going through, uh, well, I dubbed in the, what I estimated to be the, the latest water years precipitation, but you can see lots of volatility uh, when you compare the coefficient of variation of precipitation in California to the rest of the nation, we are, uh, in that sort of scaled sense, the most up and down, the most volatile region in the, in the country. So we have, um, in our natural climate, already uh, an extreme vulnerability to variability. And of course, as we look forward, uh, it's, it's quite possible, it turns out, that this could get even a little more volatile because of the nature of the changes that are coming forward. I, I don't know that um, one thing that you didn't explain, Steve, is whether people are allowed to, to <coughs> ask questions during the talk or whether that has to happen it's up to you. Okay, well, I would just as soon have a conversation than a, a <coughs> broadcast, even though we're broadcasting. But uh, that makes it more fun for me, and it, it, uh, it's a symptom of somebody's actually paying attention. So <laughs> please, uh, please let me know if there's something that, that needs clarification. I'm glad to stop, and uh, I think it, it actually... <laughs> yes, Jennifer. So, Dan, since you invited us, yeah. And I wanted to ask you about the Sierra um, record that you just showed. Yes, I'm supposed to have a microphone on. The Sierra record that you just showed um, doesn't it doesn't imply that the Sierra snowpack is uh, worse than in 1976, 1985, something around there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact. Well, first of all, this is precipitation, so it doesn't 
it doesn't account for what form it's in, snow or rain. Uh, and uh, this, this is the water year precipitation. And of course, if you, if you um, parse this by um, the calendar year, what you would have found was 2013 was extremely dry. Um, but because of the sort of the endpoint um, issue, we don't we don't see this rivaling the the record lowest uh, precip in in this region. And concerning snow, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that uh, later. But um, it turns out that even though precipitation was um, not as extreme as as record extreme. The snowpack this year was extremely low, disproportionately low compared to the precipitation. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so the current, since we're talking about the current drought, this is a, this is a picture of cumulative departures from average, uh, an average year for each one of these locations. So I've kind of switched. Um, we're not using these same uh, point-wise weather stations anymore. These are, these are collectives of aggregate weather stations. But um, the, the dots on this map are representing the average departure from a long-term average of uh, the period just after the very large El Nino of 1997-98 through, uh, that should be 2012, not 1912. Um, there's a little typo there. I'm sort of uh, kicking myself because Rama and company have this going out to the universe and any little mistake is amplified by 500 million, according to Rama. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, uh, but over 15, over the 15 years that have occurred um, in this, this, these cumulative, cumulative departures, uh, an interesting way to think of that is how many normal years of deficit in this area of the Southwest, in particular California have occurred and it turns out that we are somewhere between one and two and a half uh, average years of precipitation short over that 15 year period. So we've been living in, you know, more or less dry since that very large El Nino of, of 1997-98 and of course it's really come to a head this year where we've had now three years in succession of, of dryness in the, in the state. That's gotten pretty acute. And, um, but it's, as you saw from the, from the Sierra Nevada time series, uh, we're not unfamiliar with uh, dry spells and, and wet spells, but, um, this, this region has a, both in the instrumental record and in deep proxy records of precipitation in the state, we see evidence of, of pretty um, extreme ups and downs. And uh, here's uh, Governor Brown, who's actually now made two different drought declarations um, to uh, alert the state that um, things are happening, one earlier in January and one relatively recently as the, as the season wore on and it became clear that uh, we, you know, nature really wasn't um, going to reverse this this year. No Miracle March and so forth. So um, the, uh, the layout of the the current drought is, is shown here, and there's kind of an apex actually pretty much centered on where we are right now. And uh, the, uh, this, this extreme 
drought area is, is really strong in, in the central part of the state. And it, uh, of course, this, as often is the case, California doesn't enter drought um, on its own, but oftentimes when California is dry, some of these other uh, basins are dry. Um, in this case, the, the lower part of the Colorado River and then parts of the Rio Grande and uh, on into the, the Western Plains are, are quite dry. Um, that, that footprint of drought, of course, is really important because we import part of our water from the Colorado system. Now, it turns out this year the, there's an important dividing line here. The upper part of the Colorado Basin, which actually generates most of the water for the, for the Colorado, um, was not so dry. And they're, they're actually in better shape than they were um, in, in several years past. But um, the, the way this uh, manifests spatially, which has a lot to do with climate patterns, is, is really critical for us. Um, now it turns out that if you if you um, profile the uh, makeup of what constitutes a really dry year, and I've done this for um, scores, well not scores, but uh, the uh, in, in this case I've taken uh, several tens of years that were quite dry. And I've looked at the distribution of daily precipitation for each of those uh, dry years and um, compared them with the whole population uh, distribution. So this is precipitation in inches. So think of this as um, this is the this is a uh, essentially an average per year of the number of cases that had precipitation of various uh, categories <coughs> of magnitude. And um, we've also done this for the dry years. And the interesting thing is now if I take the ratio of the dry years compared to the, to the whole sample, what you see is the um, extreme lack of uh, occurrence of really wet events in dry years. So uh, if, you, if you go back and look at um, the contribution of, of really wet events uh, to the both wet and dry years in California, these, these relatively rare events, the big storms, have a disproportionate influence on determining whether a year is, is wetter or drier. So, um, Synoptic events have a lot to do with the longer term hydroclimate. And so in, in sort of looking forward uh, from the vantage point of, of climate models, um, their ability to capture uh, these storm events and how they, how they set up, how they evolve, their duration, magnitude, and so forth is really really quite critical in assessing what may come next. Um, so we're, we're sort of gradually working our way back in the record in order to then provide context for looking forward. And this is a picture of the average uh, temperature departure from a, uh, a long-term average, an average of, of uh, more than 60 years of the January to May, so the winter spring period of the year between 1980 and 2013. So between in that in that last 25 years or so, this is the temperature anomaly over the United States, where warm shades are positive, so it's been warmer than normal and blue are, are negative. And of course, what you see is virtually the whole country has been warm uh, in the winter and spring over this period. And California has, 
has um, participated. Uh, so we've, this is actually a time series of all months anomalies of temperature uh, going back to 1931 and you kind of see this picture. You know, it's noisy but you see the tendency for the temperatures to uh, rise over time. And, uh, you know, as, as time goes on, models are projecting that um, we're still going to see variability, of course, but um, lots of, uh, uh, in, in a relative sense, lots of change relative to this historical baseline. Now, it's interesting, returning to the, uh, just this last winter, um, uh, of course, a lot of the news was generated around the, the drought in the West and the, the cool conditions in the uh, Midwest and East, the so-called polar vortex and so forth. But um, another factor of, that evolved under this, this Western ridge was the fact that temperatures uh, in the Southwest were extremely warm. And when you look at them, this is actually temperature departures in degrees. These are degrees Fahrenheit and they're, you know, around about between three and five degrees above average for uh, the, this is December through February, so that's kind of the classical climatological winter period. So that's 90 days uh, over which the average is, is in some cases five degrees Fahrenheit above normal. So five degrees Fahrenheit, you know, we could almost, most of us can detect a five degree change if we go outside. And this is, this is um, essentially a 24 seven over 90 day average, which turns out to be these red shading means it's the warmest on record for these locations uh, in the Southwest. So it was, it was really um, quite unusual how warm it was. It was more unusual than the coolness in the, in the Midwest and the East. Um, we've, uh, this, this series of warmer springs and actually warmer summers that have occurred in the Western states since the mid 1980s um, is associated with a real, uh, strong increase in wildfires. And of course, the wildfire, uh, what causes wildfires is, is not totally clear cut. It isn't all climate because there's a lot of, of uh, human intervention and so forth that plays into that. But it's very clear from looking at not only the trend, but also the interannual variations that um, there's, a, there's a strong uh, climate component. Wildfires um, during the 15 year period since 1985 have, um, have increased by about a factor of four. Uh, so these are large wildfires greater than about a thousand acres. Uh, this has been uh, a census that uh, Tony Westerling uh, and, and others conducted over the, uh, the West. And the, the amount of acres burned um, in this latter period compared to the period previous to that has increased by sixfold. So um, we've had this burst of, um, of larger wildfires, which uh, has at least partly a climate linkage and it's interesting that um, well, Jennifer mentioned uh, snowpack in the West, and it, it turns out that if you look at um, late snowmelt years, in other words, years in which there was uh, snowpack that was um, held on longer than average uh, over this, during this period of 30 plus years, in the West, the, um, the size and the, the number of wildfires that are, have occurred, which are represented by these, these red dots, is relatively modest. 
But when you look at years in which there was early snowmelt, that is years where temperatures were warmer, uh, perhaps precipitation declined in the springtime, um, and, and we also know that this is associated often with warmer summers, um, the, uh, the, the symptoms of wildfires have, um, are comparatively enormous. And of course, looking into the future when temperatures uh, will greatly eclipse the amount of warming that we've seen over this, this relatively short period, uh, that's perhaps symptomatic of a, you know, a huge challenge. Um, drier fuels earlier and uh, longer, uh, longer essentially dry seasons and more intense uh, warmth during the summer. So there's, there's an issue. The other thing, of course, is that the western forests are loading up now with, with uh, dead trees as um, they've been hit by drought and desiccation and as um, bark beetle and other insect pests have, have taken their toll. So um, we, we have, you know, this is a really interesting problem for people that, that use remote sensing and, um, you know, are charting vegetation and, and the like, uh, as well as, as just the, um, the physical uh, forcings. Uh, I think there's going to be more and more attention to that kind of information as we go forward. Um, so I live in Southern California, and, uh, and this is actually a scene from 2003 in, in October when we had um, a conflagration. You know, we had, we had multiple <coughs> fires going at the same time, uh, and, and uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres burned in the southern part of the state. Uh, this recurred in 2007, and uh, last week we had another event, um, not nearly as, as, um, as broad and, and widespread, but we had at one point uh, nine fires burning simultaneously in the San Diego County region. Uh, we had an unusual uh, confluence of of, uh, well, first of all, very dry conditions that had, you know, we, we essentially did not recover um, our normal uh, vegetation moisture with the winter rainfall. It was just really subpar. And then we had, unusually, um, we had back-to-back -back Santa Ana, these, these hot, dry winds that occurred events um, within two and a half weeks and during the second event of course we had all these these fires but um, that normally does not happen in uh, in May and probably not so much in in April now I'm not trying to attribute that in itself to climate change I'm just saying that that's kind of symptomatic of this uh, at least um, episodically the kind of climate that we appear to be moving towards. And this is a very different landscape than the, the uh, landscape here is, is forested areas uh, by and large. So the, the big um, areas that are represented on this, this chart, and if, if we had included in this one, um, last year, of course, we would see the Rim Fire, which was the largest fire in, in California history that burned um, parts of Yosemite and the National Forest uh, to the west of it. But um, the, the, uh, this kind of fire is a, a very different, uh, in a di very different landscape and setting, and oftentimes this is a more fall, early winter kind of fire, but unusually uh, I think we just got a wake-up call that it doesn't always happen have to happen in the, uh, in the fall and winter. It can, can happen in the, the early season. So, uh, well, this is, a, this is a chart of observed uh, carbon dioxide 
concentration actually um, in the atmosphere but recorded in ice in these, in these two charts here from uh, the, the great ice sheets on Earth that are, have been recovered through, um, through ice cores. And then um, directly measured uh, here from uh, Mauna Loa in uh, actually in atmospheric samples. And of course, as we all know, um, the CO2 con concentration has increased by about 40% over pre-industrial levels. And, uh, you know, if we're lucky, um, that by the end of the century, we'll only see a doubling of CO2 uh, over pre-industrial, but if we're unlucky, it, it could well exceed a tripling. And of course, this has profound implications on the climate that is to come. And uh, when we look at um, temperatures, say over Sacramento, plucked out of uh, an ensemble of of climate models, and we're looking here. Models, of course, are run both backwards in time as well as forwards. Um, the forward part is this, this color shaded part. These are the, the retrospective uh, simulations. This happens to be uh, a set of 14 models, and then there's three different uh, emission scenarios that are played out here from the the latest uh, CMIP-5 or AR-5, uh, fifth IPCC assessment uh, simulations. And you can see that, um, first of all, in the historical simulations, the models think that it's already started to warm. And of course, observations confirm this. Uh, this is over, over Sacramento, which Sacramento is a pretty hard place to understand what the natural climate variability has been because it's it's got an urban um, contamination problem. But uh, you can see the subtle increase uh, in temperature since about the 1970s, which sort of coincides with the uh, increase in, in um, sort of greenhouse uh, gas potential uh, in the atmosphere. And then over time, uh, as we move forward, of course, all of the simulations warm, even, even the lowest ones uh, indicate that we're committed to more warming. Of course, the Earth is, is not in energy balance now. Um, it's, it's warming up and uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases, particularly CO2, has a long lifetime. So this is a, you know, this is a multi-generational um, deposit that we're making in the atmosphere. And um, in somewhere around mid-century, the, um, the emissions pathway, the collective human choices that are involved in, in how much greenhouse gases we emit start to have consequence. And the highest scenario here, which is the so-called RCP 8.5, that means 8.5 watts per square meter out of radiation balance by 2100, uh, is, is warming the most. I've dotted the three degree Celsius of warming uh, level here for you. So you can see that, that almost, well, all three of the scenarios, at least almost, um, even the lowest one, uh, reaches that magnitude in summertime over Sacramento. And um, the, the highest emission scenario kind of almost doubles that by, by the end of the century. So that's, um, that's a huge amount of warming. It's, it's a large amount of warming pretty much no matter what we do, but it's an enormous amount of warming if we sort of continue along the present pathway of this highest emissions uh, rate that we're going in here. Um, one thing to point out here is that the models generally indi indicate that uh, over continents, the um, summer is warming more than the winter. That's probably a land feedback. And again, that 
um, I think reinforces a lot of the work that um, some of you do in, in looking at terrestrial systems. And um, the, uh, the other thing is that as you map these, these changes out, you see that there's quite a gradient as you move from the coast of California inland. Uh, the coastal areas, of course, are kind of buffered by the, uh, the oceanic uptake of heat, which, um, you know, they absorb as much heat, but they're, they're depositing it in a, in a broad water column, so it's, it's not uh, as great a temperature rise. So th those are things that we need to uh, track and better understand as things go forward, and we also need more resolved views of, of all that, which is part of the, the message that I'm, I'm trying to deliver. Um, the models these days now can, can also be used to look at events um, on a synoptic scale as well as um, averages and so forth. And by the way, um, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, this, these dark curves here are are just the median of this ensemble of 14. So um, we don't tend to trust any one model, but we hope that um, the ensemble average has, has some degree of, of realism as we go forward. The, um, in this case, we're looking at, again, a, a, a set of models and we're, we're um, cataloging uh, what I'm calling heat waves here as we go forward. And um, this only has four GCMs uh, in, in this case, but it, it makes the point, and there's two different emission scenarios uh, in this case. These are fourth IPCC assessment AR4 models. They're not the, the latest one, but the uh, similar results would emerge if we did the fifth. And what you can see is that um, a heat wave here, which I've defined as uh, a, daily, um, a daily maximum temperature exceeding the, uh, the 98th percentile level, so that would happen. A summer has, um, I don't know, 120 days or so, so there's about two days on average per year of, of heat waves in this historical part, and as we go forward, this is the 20 per year line, so that um, somewhere in the middle of the century, uh, we're, we're having 10 times the number of, of heat wave events, according to this choice of model simulations. And then as we go forward, of course, the, um, the high emission scenario models, um, you know, greatly eclipse that. Uh, so one of the keys uh, in terms of our, our uh, resources, uh, not only direct water resources, but ecosystems and all those things that depend on water is the fate of the snowpack in California. Um, this is a scene uh, from Levining looking up into the uh, into Levining Canyon up towards Yosemite Park. And, um, you know, in today's climate, uh, in, the, in the late spring, there's often still snow up in, in those ranges. But um, turns out that if you look at the uh, proportion of precipitation that occurs in a relatively narrow temperature environment, between freezing and just below freezing, so this is between zero Celsius and three Celsius below. Um, Mike Dettinger, my, my colleague, has, has made a census of the fraction of, of the total precipitation that occurs in that temperature environment. And what you notice is that the west really stands out. So we get a lot of our, our precipitation in this, uh, in this temperature range that is just below zero. So read that as it's snowing. But if we raise our temperature by three degrees Celsius, then it's quite conceivable that the snow is now rain. And um, you can see that uh, the west slope of the Cascades and the Sierras really stand out 
in, uh, in having uh, parts of watersheds that are in that regime. We've already seen the signs of warming. This is Noah Knowles uh, who looked at um, uh, weather records that collected uh, snow fall as well as rainfall and he was able to parse out the changes since uh, just, uh, just after World War II through, in this case, 2004, uh, stations that had transitioned towards either more snow or more rain. The more rain part is the red, and your eye tells you that um, there's a pretty broad occurrence of uh, stations that have, have uh, shifted towards rainier rather than snowier. So roughly, I don't know, somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the, of the stations that Noah was able to look at here um, show those kinds of changes. The other thing is that when we look at uh, snow that's um, cored and weighed in snow courses in in uh, both in California as well as um, other areas of the West. Um, and we've looked at um, the snow courses arrayed by their temperature or read this elevation. So the higher elevation are cooler, the lower elevation are warmer. And there's both a model rendition of this and a, an observed uh, rendition. This is work by Phil Mote and colleagues Phil was formerly at the University of Washington. Uh, what this clearly shows is that the loss of accumulated snow in the West has been happening in the middle to lower elevations, the warmer parts of the mountainous watersheds. And they're all showing this. Um, the, this is the uh, Pacific Northwest, so the Cascades. This is the northern Rockies, and uh, this would be the southern Rockies. They all have this characteristic, uh, essentially a fingerprint of warming in uh, snow loss. So we've seen over this um, western domain, we've seen about a 10% loss of April 1st uh, snow water equivalent uh, over this period between 1950 and um, the 2000s. So um, a relatively modest uh, change in, in snow, uh, but detectable already uh, with the, the level of warming that we've, we've seen over these last few decades. We've looked at this in, in uh, climate simulations, and uh, climate simulations then played through a hydrologic model. So this is um, this is California, and the inset map shows here the, the blue colored scale represents the fraction of today's historical snow water content in springtime uh, in the 2030 epoch in 2060 and 2090. These are actually averages about those periods. So think of this as kind of early um, early middle, uh, 21st century, uh, later middle, and finally later 21st century. And the color scale means blue is essentially today's levels. Um, red gets to be below 30% of today's levels of snow. Um, and what you see through, this is through one hydrological model, uh, which happens to be uh, driven by one GCM, which is a fairly conservative amount of warming, about two degrees Celsius of warming over the 21st century. But in this simulation, we've lost about uh, a third of the snowpack by mid-century, and we've lost over half of the snowpack uh, by the end of the century. Now, that doesn't mean we've lost water, but what it means is that we've lost the storage of, of water in the snowpack. And of course, that's really critical because California uh, collectively in its, um, in its built reservoirs has 
roughly, uh, I don't know, maybe a year and a half of a normal year supply. Uh, it's not like the big reservoirs on the Colorado system or the Columbia system. So we're um, in, the, in the midst of all this volatility, we don't have really that much built storage. So the, the snowpack has been a, a resource, of course, that water managers have relied upon as they go forward. Now we've, we've repeated these experiments, and I don't know, it's kind of hard to see this inset map here, but we've looked at this domain of essentially the snow-laden areas of, of California going forward, and we've looked, you know, we've, again, um, several climate projections. Uh, in this case, we've actually taken 32 of them from the AR4 um, uh, generation, and uh, this is the precipitation median over this period of, this goes back to 1950 and goes through 2100. And, you know, to sort of zero order, uh, there's been really little change in precipitation over this period, but here's the snow water equivalent um, aggregated over this domain for the April 1 period. And, um, and it declines uh, considerably. This is the temperature um, that was used to, to drive that, uh, that hydrological model simulation. This is the median, and, and each model is a dot here. And um, of course, the, the temperature increases, um, well, more than two degrees Celsius. This doesn't start at zero, so um, the scale is, is a little deceptive. Uh, but here's the snow again, and um, the result in, in this set of uh, simulations is that we're down to about a third of what we started with in the snow water over the Sierra by the end of the century under this sort of hybrid. Uh, I have two, two different um, emission scenarios in this, in this picture. And one way you can sort of think about this is the odds of achieving median snowpack historically over time. So you can kind of think of this as a game of roulette and ask the question of how many times do I, do I get up to average or median. And the answer is that by the end of the century, um, we're down to what? Uh, historically was, of course, one out of two, you know, every other year or on average is, is uh, median or above. Um, we're down to one out of 10 uh, in the historical period. And you can also ask the, the question of how many times do I only uh, achieve a 10th uh, percentile uh, snow year and the odds increase from one out of 10 to uh, about four out of 10 by the end of the century. So our, it's, it's very clear that the, um, our historical experience does not serve us in, in looking forward. So you've heard this expression of stationarity is dead and you know this is, this is an example of of how that is playing out. Now, the other thing that's happening as, um, you know, we're not collecting as much snow in, in these mountainous watersheds as, as time goes on, so this is supposed to show you that the, the uh, dividing line between rain and snow is, is elevating. And, um, and that has uh, not only implications for the the how people have to deal with um, managing the water in the springtime, but there's an immediate problem because our reservoir system is built not only for as a storage vessel, it's, it's a uh, flood protection vehicle. And um, because we are, we are essentially exposing more of these watersheds to immediate runoff, all of a sudden we're flashier, we have, we have more floods as time goes forward. So there's a, another challenge that's built into that, um, into that water management picture 
as we move into the future. Um, this shows, uh, again, from a hydrological perspective, from a, an ensemble of models, the uh, soil moisture uh, departures, blue are positive and, and red are, are negative, uh, through the course of the 21st century, so early, middle, and late. And of course, the intensity of, of drying of the landscape, according to these model simulations, uh, is, is really building up over, over time. So that has um, agricultural and uh, ecosystem and uh, hazards implications. We already talked about the, the uh, wildfire situation. So um, the, la the last little excerpt that I wanted to show was um, a coastal one. Uh, because, of course, as, as climate warms, um, global sea levels are going to rise. And along the coast here in California, uh, we've experienced something like half a foot of sea level rise over the last century. So that's something that um, probably we're equipped to um, dealing with. And, uh, you know, natural and human systems have kind of gotten along okay. But um, occasionally we get, we get, um, we get relatively short-term sea level rise and we get big storms on top of that. And, and one of the, you know, I guess one of the lessons about climate change is, is often it's not the slow secular changes that are the big, big problem, but it's the, it's the short period events that, that sort of ride on top of those. And this is a scene from January 1983, it turns out that January 27th of 1983, we saw by and large the highest sea levels that have been recorded along the, the west coast where we had, um, we had high tide, uh, high astronomical tides. We had this El Nino effect that elevated sea levels because of both wind forcing and, and warmer waters, uh, steric influences along the the eastern boundary of the, of the Pacific Basin. And, and we had these really large uh, winter cyclones that um, were responsible for that, for that very turbulent ocean that we saw there. So this is a picture of the hours of exceedance over the uh, about one in 10,000 hours level. So that's one hour out of about 14 months, one hour per year, say, uh, historically uh, over, over time. But as, as this turns out, um, that level of exceedance doesn't happen every year. And um, in fact, there's a few years when it happens a lot. In 1983 happened to be the year when it, you know, it really happened because we had the confluence of um, we just happened to have big storms on top of these high spring tides that year. Um, 1998, we had very high sea levels. We had a very large El Nino, but fortunately we sort of dodged bullets because the storms didn't happen to peak right at the uh, peak tide. But um, in the future, uh, assuming that there's, go there's gonna be sea level rise that kind of elevates the mean levels, um, it's, it's these kinds of winters that are going to be um, causing havoc in, uh, along our, our coast and other, other locations. You know, a, another version of this is Hurricane Sandy, of course, and, um, you know, we have our, our own version of that. But this is a chart that shows um, a projection of mean sea level, which is about a, close to a meter of sea level rise by the end of the century. And then superimposed on that, we've, we have a little model that is able to account for um, hourly sea level at, uh, in this case, San Francisco. And we're simply uh, tallying up the, in this case, um, this is the, again, the number of hours of exceedance. And you can see that as time goes on, the number of uh, exceedances becomes 
eventually commonplace. So just about every high tide, uh, well, or maybe every other one becomes a really high sea level. So if that, if that reference level I'm talking about is a seawall and your house is on the other side of it or a road or, um, you know, a, um, say a sewage outlet or a wastewater outlet in the case of um, the city of San Francisco, there's, you know, there's big problems here. And of course, there's lots of layers of problems because this is a global issue and, you know, there's sort of um, geopolitical problems that populations have to adjust and, and all that. So this sea level rise problem is, is one, is a very nasty part of climate change. And of course, this doesn't end in 2100. And of course, 2100, you know, we could stretch this or condense this depending on how fast sea level rises because that's, that's pretty uncertain. There's a pretty wide envelope of, of estimates. But it's pretty clear that um, as the Earth warms, the big um, stockpiles of, of ice uh, on Earth are going to add more volume to the ocean, and the ocean, of course, is going to warm up. So uh, this is a summary, um, and I'm not sure that because time has uh, been escaping here, let me let you um, look at that at your leisure if you want to. But I do want to mention what I think are some needs <coughs> that a lot of us can um, participate in. And you know, this is kind of collective experience from these, uh, these regional climate assessments. Um, first of all, there's a, there's a really crucial need for observations and monitoring, scientific monitoring of of not only physical systems, but biological systems and, and human systems. So for example, um, I'm working with a medical doctor who's trying to understand the linkage between a species of medical condition and, and environmental condition. But without records, we can't get anywhere. And so we need, you know, we need scientific samples conducted year after year after year after year in a lot of these systems in order to make these, um, make these linkages to verify and construct models and mechanisms and so forth. And um, we, uh, you know, also we need models that often are, are observations that uh, the ones that are needed are often much at much more detailed levels than the information we've uh, historically collected. So remote sensing, of course, gives us a great advantage there. So what it may not have in length, it may offer in, in its um, granularity. Uh, the other thing that we need is we need models, and we need models calculated at, at higher resolutions than we've traditionally um, looked at, and uh, Rama and colleagues are, are supporting uh, downscaling of global models to regional domains and all sorts of interesting and important calculations that we can use to conduct these sorts of assessments. Um, we need to consider a range of scenarios, so think of um, these models, you know, we, we can't uh, we're not well served by looking at single models. We, you know, these days we look at, at ensembles, the, the latest uh, CMIP-5 or IPCC uh, collection has more than 40 uh, global models now and multiple emission scenarios and some of the models have multiple realizations. And so we're able to look at, you know, more of a spread. Uh, and, Furthermore, we need to look at extreme events um, in, in these simulations because it's the extremes that drive a lot of the really important consequences. Um, another another uh, way of thinking about this is that we need to not only look at uh, this problem from sort of a top-down perspective that is driving systems from a set of of what happens in the 21st century from a set of models, 
but we also have to understand how vulnerable the systems are themselves. Because the models are uncertain and, um, and we could be led astray because model physics are incorrect or our scenarios are incorrect or something. But if we know how, how a system responds and we know what its um, sort of uh, tipping or breakpoints are, then we have some advantage in, in sort of conducting what if and what we have to, to sort of calculate in the future. So I think both of those uh, perspectives have to be accommodated. And then finally, um, the uh, ability to communicate um, with decision makers. Um, there's one form of communication is, is kind of like this where some guy gets up and he starts talking and, and they all go home and you know, take notes and do whatever they do. But the other is that um, decision makers know more about their systems than we do and that's important in devising the set of experiments, the set of measures and so forth that are needed to inform them in their, uh, their planning and uh, adaptation and so forth. Uh, so, you know, that two-way communication is, is really critical. Um, the other thing that I think is sorely in need of communication across our various uh, sets of expertise is the ability to communicate um, the, the um, essentially the, uh, the boundary conditions that we work in, you know, what are the constraints, what is the uncertainty of the result, you know, do I give him the ensemble mean and he's happy with that, that's probably not, um, that's, you know, I think, I think users deserve to know what the endpoints are and, and how much spread there is and, and that sort of thing. And I think we have to acquaint uh, users with dealing with uncertainty because there's, there's, a, um, there's a strong tendency on the, uh, on the part of many users to want very simplified answers. To, to these things. They want to know how much temperature rise am I going to be confronted with and so forth. But, you know, farmers don't operate under that kind of construct. They, they are used to the fact that, you know, there's variability and um, they're going to, you know, they, things are, are, are not going to be um, served by climatology uh, as they look at any particular year. And, and so users uh, are going to have to become more sophisticated in dealing with uncertainty because that is the world that, that we live in and it's pretty clear that we're not going to um, escape from that as, as time goes forward. Well, I, was, I probably went too long. But, uh, So the West Antarctic ice sheet's been in the news, and now it seems, I mean, people have got this pretty well modeled once it happens. I guess the once it happens part has been uncertain, but now they're seeing it happen. So can you update us on uh, what that time scale is and how much sea level rise is involved? I, I'm not sure I can. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a glaciologist, and um, I actually served on the NRC panel that looked at sea level rise along the West Coast, and I got... I got to have great respect for the for the the people that were dealing with the um, the ice part of the system, and um, I mean I've heard I've sort of heard the same stories that you've heard about this stockpile of of um, sort of latent sea level rise that that is uh, stored there, and the fact that it's no longer buttressed, and and now there's you know there's more of a free flow. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know how much, and I don't know if, to be honest, I don't know if these most recent observations actually 
would lead to an acceleration of, of sea level rise. One thing that we can say, I think, is that um, over the, over about the 20th century, the mean rate of sea level rise has been about two millimeters per year, um, which then, you know, what's the big deal? But in the last um, 17 years or so since we've had altimeters um, and looking at the ocean more comprehensively um, as opposed to tide gauges, um, sea level rise has increased uh, to about three millimeters per year. And it's reckoned that um, I, I think still the majority of more than 50% of sea level rise to, um, in the last few decades is still accounted for by steric increases. That is because water is warming uh, rather than water volume as mass is being added to the ocean. But um, eventually those, those trajectories are gonna cross and the, um, I guess I should do it like this, the, um, <laughs> The ice melt part is going to um, eventually become much larger than the steric increase. Um, there's, you know, many meters of sea level rise that are are stored in uh, Antarctica and, and Greenland. I think there, Greenland has um, seven meters, and Antarctica is um, is tens of meters, but um, there have been calculations about um, sort of what ifs if all of the ice streams um, conceivable through these, these channels that exist, including Antarctica, I think, were to, um, to go at their sort of maximal rate eventually. And um, at least at that time, which goes back now two years, the estimate was that the most um, the greatest amount of sea level rise that we could get by 2100 was, would be about two meters over today's level. Now two meters, you know, I mean, just throw around a meter and now two meters doesn't seem like that much, but you know, compared to, to um, half a foot, which is, you know, what, a sixth of a meter or a seventh of a meter, um, the the rate of sea level rise that we're talking about in, in the future is just, it's, it's really large. And so this is, um, th this is kind of a big problem and it's really a question of time scale, I think, because eventually this is probably gonna happen. This is a formal affair. You can't ask a question <laughs> without well, you, any. You can, but you have to have a microphone. <laughs> yeah, it um, was without the any a, part. A few years ago, there was a workshop on um, impacts of climate change, and, and a map was shown that of what the projected temperature increase was, essentially over the entire northern uh, or the entire United States. And I've I've actually had looked for that map and never been able to find it online. And and but. Um, what I'm recalling is that there was so, sort of a band right around the coastal regions which was gonna have the least impact. Um, and you haven't shown anything uh, about that, but could you say something about what, yeah. what that projection is? I, I talked about it, but I didn't show it. Um, but I do have this little stockpile of slides here. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, maybe, if I'm lucky, <coughs> well, I, I don't have it, but um, what our our calculations uh, indicate from, from looking at um, a handful of simulations is that, um, well, in summertime, the, 
uh, coastal region might warm by, say, a degree and a half Celsius by the end of the century. The um, area, say, east of the Sierras, or maybe even in the, the Central Valley, could warm by four degrees Celsius. So there, there are these gradients. But the problem is that the GCMs are pretty crude. They have spatial, um, you know, they operate on, on spatial dimensions of, well, these days, maybe 100 kilometers or so, 100 to 150. Um, so that's, you know, it doesn't resolve the processes that actually ventilate the coast and so forth. So there's concerns in, in California ranging from um, people that supply energy uh, because a lot of the people live along that coastal margin uh, to, say, the um, premium grape growers in, um, in Napa and Sonoma who, um, you know, the amount of warming that occurs there, uh, there versus, say, the um, Lodi is, is a really important question because there's a certain amount of temperature rise that actually um, it, it becomes uncomfortable for various species to sort of that they traditionally have. So I don't really have all of the answer for you. The other interesting thing is that there have been some studies of California historical records that indicate that, well, minimum temperatures, nighttime temperatures, have warmed quite a bit. Um, along the coastal region, the daytime amount of warming that we've seen over the last five, six decades has been relatively flat. And that's thought to be some kind of reaction of the, uh, what you might call the sea breeze ventilation. But um, I don't know that that's been totally um, well understood and confirmed at this point. So that's, that's a kind of an empirical hypothesis. I was just, I was just curious uh, with all of these uh, studies that they're doing on the climate change, are they also monitoring what changes are taking place in the food supply in the water? Um, well, I'd hazard to say yes, but boy, this gets beyond my depth. Um, you know, there's there's lots of agencies that are collecting information on, you know, over. I mean, there's the um, World Health Organization and and UNESCO uh, organized activities that are that are looking at um, things on a global over a global context. And of course, we have our own version of that, um, both nationally and, and from the state. I will say it's California is, is kind of a model state in a lot of this because they are, they are um, first of all, they're concerned about the um, potential impacts of climate change. They're thinking about how to prepare for it. And um, they're, they're organizing. Um, and planning, at least in sort of a state agency, which then there is some legislation that's permeating um, local agencies uh, that it is causing a lot of um, sort of introspection about how we might deal with with climate here. So um, that's a that's a good thing. So like a politician, I just diverted your question to a different topic, but. Um, Anyway, I thought I'd talk about something I could talk about instead of something that I couldn't. Um, let, let's see, this is kind of an aside question, but I think it's still relevant. Um, this year, 2014, the equatorial um, temperatures in the Pacific are showing as signs of a major or super El Nino, maybe akin to the 97, 98, and the 82, 83. Mm. Um, this could give us some relief for California, for sure. What, what are your takes on the possibility of a super El Nino this, this winter and or these events occurring more frequently or, or not? 
Well, uh, as to whether it's going to turn into super or even really large is, you know, I mean, there's, there certainly have been cases of El Nino forecast gone bad. Uh, so we're trying to temper, you know, curb your enthusiasm, lad. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it, does, it does look, um, you know, signs are, are kind of lining up, at least for an El Nino, and um, we'll see. And we have not had a large El Nino since 98, and by and large, we've had more La Ninas than, than El Nino. But as far as, um, I think I do have this slide in here, El Nino, you might ask the question of what's the likelihood of, um, of getting back to normal in one year. So this is a slide that was uh, assembled by my, my colleague, Mike Dettinger. And um, what, um, this is a little complicated, but um, if, um, if things were normal, our cumulative uh, precipitation at this point in the game should be, um, I think it's, it's here. I have to be a little careful about this. So here we are, October, this is October of 14. Okay, so um, we are, in order to, to make up to normal, we'd have to we would have had to have been here as far as this is the Sacramento drainage. And then what Mike has done is he's played every El Nino on record through uh, this picture superimposing on the deficits we've already collected. <coughs> and in order to get a normal year, we have to get up to here, okay, uh, by, by next, the end of next water year. And what you can see is that of the 16 uh, El Nino years on record, there's not many of them that manage to make it to, to normal. So the take home message from this is that, well, we could get relief. Um, we probably still won't um, be out of the, the sort of longer term reservoir dryness uh, deficit by the end of the next winter, even if it's a you know, big, big El Nino. So, I mean, it will definitely, the, the thing about El Nino is that El Ninos come in lots of shapes and sizes and, and they range from pretty wet, 1983, 98, 1940, 41, um, quite wet, but other ones that were actually um, really dry. So it, on the other hand, if it's a very large El Nino, I think it, it tilts the odds towards the, the wetter side. Uh, circling back for just a moment to the question on the Antarctic uh, Western Ice Shelf. Uh, just this week, I went to a lecture by uh, oceanographer Sylvia Earle, and she mm. laid out a fairly convincing uh, portrayal of the point of no, no return as uh, already in the rear view mirror for that particular ice shelf. And she, uh, anyway, I recommend uh, maybe, you know, looking into some of her publications on, on the topic. Yeah. She's made a, a real life uh, focus on this. Okay. But um, so translating then to the tropics, uh, do you have any um, uh, crystal ball into what's happening in the Hawaiian Islands as far as uh, precipitation? And they're, they're going through quite a long dry spell now, but of course there's, it's just increasing variability all over the place. But in the long run, what do you see happening there in the Hawaiian Islands? I, I have to confess I haven't looked at Hawaii in particular, but if you look at um, the um, sort of the global makeup of precipitation changes over the next century, the subtropics, um, so Hawaii kind of lives in, you know, part of it is in the tropics and part of it is more subtropics. But the, the subtropics tend to get drier on large if you just take an average picture. So, um, 
I think in Hawaii, you know, Hawaii gets both trade wind rain and they get um, conus, you know, they get westerly wind driven rain in, um, in the winter season. And the westerlies, you know, a kind of oversimplified view of what happens is the westerlies tend to recede a little farther north under climate change. So if the trade wind rains sort of stay as they are, um, and but the, the winter component declines, it could be that there's some areas in Hawaii that, that suffer, but this deserves more attention than, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at it uh, carefully, so that's a great question. But, um, you know, in, in our neck of the woods, um, it's um, th that kind of question, the answer gets, um, gets more negative, gets um, leaner as far as uh, water as we go farther south. So Mexico, for example, um, is in the locus of, of negative changes in their annual precipitation. We, we've looked at this quite a bit from, from different models in California, and um, California is, um, is affected by, there's a couple different phenomena going on. One is that um, in most of the subtropical and Mediterranean areas, uh, the number of, of days of precipitation within a year becomes less, so less, less chances, less rain days. But um, it also turns out that um, in our area anyway, the heaviest precipitation days tend to become a little heavier. And you can sort of rationalize that by knowing that as climate warms, the atmosphere in general gets moister because there's more evaporation. And so the, um, we have this competition between um, lower frequency of precipitation but greater intensity. And um, it turns out that, that that competition, the lower frequency part of it, wins as you go farther south. And, um, but other, I would say this, that, that compared, from the model perspective, compared to other Mediterranean areas, California looks better than say the European Mediterranean or um, say South Africa, uh, other, most other global, there's about five Mediterranean regions and, and we somehow seem to be doing better over time. Well, with that, let's, uh, let's thank Dan again. Thank and thank you all for your attention and participation.